All right, y'all, welcome to another exciting screencast dealing with ocean currents. In this uh, screencast here, we're going to talk a little bit about what currents are. We'll talk about what surface currents are. And we'll also get a little bit into deep ocean currents. Now, deep ocean currents, we're just going to touch on because we're going to get more into, more into deep ocean currents in class. Okay, so what is a current? A current is simply a continuous, T-I-N... U O U S motion of a fluid. A continuous motion of a fluid. And all that means is anything that can flow is a fluid. So air can be a fluid. Water can be a fluid. Why? Because these guys can flow. And a current is a continuous motion of a fluid. Now, most of the currents that we're going to talk about are surface currents. And as the name implies, a surface current, these are currents that are close to the surface of the ocean water. So here's the ocean. Here's the ocean basin down here. This guy's here is the ocean basin. That's where all the little starfish are. Here's Patrick. Hello. And over here is SpongeBob, right here. Eh, 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 eh. So there you got Patrick and SpongeBob. They're hanging out in the ocean basin. Here's the surface of the water. Here's the butt over here. And here's Finding. Here's little Nemo right here. All right, enough of that. Wait, that doesn't look like Nemo at all. Okay, hold on. That's a horrible fish. Wait a minute. There we go. Now that's a better fish. There's Nemo, and here's the butt. Well, this is the surface. When we talk about surface currents, we're just talking about the first couple hundred meters of the ocean water. Remember, I know it sounds like a lot, but the ocean goes down for thousands of meters. So we're really just talking about the first few hundred meters. The first few hundred meters deep sorry for the sloppy writing the first few hundred meters deep maybe we're only talking about the first four three to four hundred meters or so and again remember the ocean is thousands of meters deep so this really is not that deep into the ocean i didn't draw this to scale in fact if this was to scale we would just be talking about this little tiny piece of the ocean right here if this was the actual depth of the ocean the whole thing we would just be talking about this tiny 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 little tiny portion right over here so we have currents are continuous motion of a fluid such as air or water and surface currents this is the motion of the water right at the surface of the ocean here's a world map showing most of the world's large ocean currents you'll notice that we have a couple over here in the atlantic ocean here's a big counterclockwise moving one and here's a big clockwise moving one and over in the pacific we have the northern pacific one that's moving clockwise and then the southern pacific one that's spinning counterclockwise and then there's another one over here in the indian ocean anyways the question is is how come they're making these big circular patterns how come we just don't have a flowing of water that maybe goes directly from side to side? Or how come not a flow of water that goes from the equator up north to the Arctic or from the equator down to the Antarctic? And the next couple of things that we're going to discuss will help us answer that. So to help us understand one of the variables that causes surface currents, I'm going to go ahead and use this little pan of water here and this little uh, star that has a duck on it. I'm going to place it in the water. Kind of gently, I don't want to disturb the water too much. It's already shaking a little bit. And all I'm going to do is move the duck from one side to the other. Now, how did I do that? Well, there was a little bit of wind. And the wind is one of the primary causes of surface currents. But if that's true, how come the surface currents just don't blow from one side of the ocean to the other? And to answer that, Let's go ahead and we have to learn a little bit about the Coriolis effect. So if the wind is a major factor in surface currents like we just saw in the previous demonstration, how come it doesn't just blow straight across the ocean? And what I mean by that is this. I have this golf ball here and I'm going to go ahead and put it in some baking powder to give it a little coating here. And I got this table 
that I can uh, spin. But before I spin it, I'm just going to go ahead and stop it. And I'm going to roll it straight across. Roll off some of the extra. And what you'll notice is that we have this pattern, this, this line going straight down the white cloth here, going straight down the paper towel. Well, that would be expected. If I'm just going to roll the ball straight down, I'm going to get a straight line going across the paper towel. But if we put this guy back in the cocoa to put a little bit more on there, give it a little bit more of a coating, and now I and now I spin this guy, watch what's going to happen. When I roll it across, I'm not going to get a straight line. Check it out. And go. Whoa. Look at that. I got this big curved line here. How come it didn't go straight across? Because the surface was spinning. And as the surface was spinning, the ball was trying to roll across, it got deflected across the spinning surface. This is the same thing that happens to air. This is the same thing that happens to ocean water. Why? Because the earth is spinning. And because air and water are fluids, they're not attached to the earth like a solid mountain that's immobile. They are fluids that are able to flow. And because the earth is spinning, as it turns, it deflects the direction in which those fluids are flowing. So let's take this, cover this back up. But don't tell my kids I put a golf ball in there. So to drive this point home, let's go ahead and take a look at this map of global wind distribution. This, had, this is not ocean currents, these are wind patterns. And let's go ahead and focus right here in the Atlantic Ocean, the Northern Atlantic. We have this big circulation here of counterclockwise air that moves in the North Atlantic. And if we take a look at the South Atlantic, there's this big counterclockwise circulation of air in the South Atlantic. Now let's cruise over to the Pacific. Here is a clockwise motion in the northern Pacific, and here's this big old counterclockwise circle of air in the southern Pacific. Now, instead of taking a look at this air map, let's go ahead and switch to an ocean current map. All right, so here you'll notice that we have that same map from pre the previous slide the showing the global distribution of air patterns. And down here we have a big map showing the global distribution of surface currents on Earth. Let's concentrate again in the northern Atlantic, and you'll notice that we have this big circulation of air that's going clockwise in the northern hemisphere. And down here, we have this big circulation of ocean currents that's also going clockwise in the northern Atlantic. And if we look at the South Atlantic, we have this big ocean current that's going counterclockwise in the South Atlantic. And if we take a look at our air map, we have a big counterclockwise circulation of air in the southern above the southern atlantic the pacific ocean same thing a big counterclockwise circulation of air in the northern pacific and a big clockwise circulation of water in the northern pacific in the southern pacific we have a big counterclockwise circulation of air and in the southern pacific we have a big counterclockwise circulation of water in short the circulating air is part of what's driving the circulating ocean currents. All right, so, so far we've talked about two variables that help drive surface currents. We talked about the wind and the Coriolis effect and how the Coriolis effect will deflect the wind and make it curve. Well, one more thing we have to talk about is temperature. And to help us do that, let's go back to our old friend, the lava lamp. And if we remember with the lava lamp, we have a heat source down here and that causes the material to rise. And then what winds up happening is it gets cold because it moved away from the heat source and that causes it to sink. Well, this also applies to global surface currents. Here's a map showing average global temperatures. Uh, basics, the, the reds and the greens and the yellows are warmer and the blues are colder. We have a gauge down here that tells the temperatures. But when we take a look at our tropic regions, that's anywhere from around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, from there and in between there to the equator, these tropic regions, you're going to obviously notice that these are much warmer. Why are they warmer? Because they're receiving more direct insolation. S-O-L-A-T-I-O-N. And if you remember, from way back in first semester, we said that insulation was the amount of direct sunlight that any place on Earth receives. And we said that the tropics to the equator, both north and south, 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south, down to the equator, 
receive the most direct insulation from the sun than anywhere else on earth and the land is warmer not only is the land warmer but also the water is warmer as well so what's the effect of that well from the equator we tend to have warm water move out towards the poles and then we have cold water move towards the equator from the poles and the same is true in the southern hemisphere we have warm water move out towards the poles and we have cold water move in from the poles. But remember, water doesn't just circulate straight up and down like this. The wind blows it one way, and we also have the Coriolis effect. So what we wind up having happen is this. We wind up getting warm air that circulates up this way in a curved pattern. And we get cold water that circulates down this way again in a curved pattern and when we take a look at this on a map that isn't as colorful maybe a little bit easier to see it looks like this where we have warm water moving up from the equator up towards the poles and we have cold water moving down from the poles down to the equator and we can see the same thing in the southern hemisphere we have warm water moving down from the equator towards the poles and we have this colder water moving up from the poles towards the equator. And we get these big circulation patterns of warm and cold water. Now these big, huge individual circulation patterns, they're called gyres. A gyre is simply, it's an individual current. We have a South Pacific current over here, a South Pacific gyre. We have a North Pacific gyre. We have a North Atlantic gyre over here, South Atlantic gyre, Indian Ocean gyre. And the whole thing, when you look at a gyre or an individual current, half of it will be made up of cold water and the other half will be made up of warm water. And there's a big misconception out there that in California you get the most beautiful warm water right over here on the coast of California. Well, honestly, that's incorrect. When I was growing up in San Diego, I was actually surprised to know that the water coming in the coastline of California, it's really cold because this is polar water moving in in a clockwise fashion down towards the equator. If you want to get some warm water, you have to go to the east coast of the United States. That's where the warm water from the equator is moving up in a clockwise fashion toward or all along the coast of the United States. And it's also one of the major reasons why the east coast of the United States gets hurricanes and the western coast of the United States does not. In order to get a hurricane, you need this really warm ocean water to put a lot of energy into the atmosphere because heat is energy and this warm water gives energy into the atmosphere so you get hurricanes. Because the water over here is colder, they don't get the same hurricanes that uh, on the western coast that they get over here on the eastern coast. So make sure you write something down about gyres and what a gyre is. Again, a gyre is just a circulation of air within a current. And make sure you write something down about temperature and how temperature affects the circulation of ocean water. All right, so the last two things to talk about will happen real quick. Uh, the last two influences on surface currents. It would be the shape of the coastlines. Notice that a lot of the currents do follow the shapes of the coastlines. So that's another variable. And the last one would also be gravity. Now gravity is going to become more of a factor when we start talking about deep ocean currents. But gravity is a force that will pull the water down below the surface and have it circulate from the shallow to the deep. So it does have an effect on the shallow oceans, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we start talking about the deep ocean currents. All right, so in this video, we talked about currents. We mainly stuck with surface currents, and we talked about how they were affected by the wind, Coriolis effect, temperature, coastlines, and it's slightly by gravity. I know the gravity thing I didn't really get into. I wanted to really save that for the deep ocean currents. Deep ocean currents, the only thing you should really know about that is these are the ocean currents that are below the currents, uh, below the surface currents. And again, we'll talk about that more on Monday. Have a great weekend. Go Hawks. If you guys have any questions, as always, feel free to send me a message on Edmodo or send me an email.